so Wendy, thank you for taking the time to talk to me and the students at the University of Waterloo today. It's, uh, I know it's going to be very valuable uh, for them to learn about what you're doing uh, in Halifax. But I thought that the pl a good place for us to start, because many of the students will never have had the uh, pleasure and privilege of visiting Atlantic Canada, uh, but could you tell them about about the Halifax region and the local economy? So thank you so much, Dr. Carr, for having me and hello class. Uh, if you have not been to Halifax, I welcome you here. Um, Halifax is, our population is just shy of 450,000 people. Um, this, we have seen uh, record-breaking population growth year after year since 2015, and I'll get into that into a moment about why that is and who is coming here. Um, geographically, we are huge. I looked up our uh, area, uh, physical area, as it com uh, compares to Kitchener-Waterloo. So we are 5,490 square kilometers compared to 136.9 Kitchener-Waterloo. So we are a large geographic mass that we are on the ocean. Mo most of our municipality is, is waterfront or very close to waterfront. And we are the largest urban center uh, for Atlantic Canada, largest urban center north of Boston and east of Quebec City, east of Montreal. Um, so we have all of the amenities here in Halifax that you would expect of a major urban center um, because this is the hub of government, the arts, entertainment, um, and community. Now, Halifax is home to multiple post-secondary institutions. The Nova Scotia at large, our, our province, has 10 universities, the majority of which are either in Halifax or have a footprint in Halifax. So we are definitely a university town, um, at which is what is a massive driver of our economy. Now more and more innovative companies are choosing Halifax because of the quality of the post-secondary uh, institutions, both research and the talent uh, that graduates from our, uh, from our post-secondaries here. Um, our economy is largely service-based, uh, well over 80% of our labor force works in the service industry, and um, that includes finance. We are a major healthcare center, both in terms of health care delivery and research. Our post-secondary institutions, as I mentioned, financial institutions, ICT, ocean science, uh, and tourism and hospitality. So the sectors that I mentioned at the outset have done very, very well during COVID. Tourism hospitality, very, very poorly. And so I'll speak to that in a moment in terms of how that has shaken out as we progress through COVID. Thank you. Uh, you're the Chief Executive Officer of the Halifax Partnership. And uh, uh, what does the Halifax Partnership do and, and, and what's your job involved? So Halifax Partnership is Halifax's public private economic development organization. So we strive for nothing less than a vibrant and successful Halifax. And we work with government, private sector, and our post-secondary partners to grow Halifax's economy and really focus on growing our uh, economy uh, in an inclusive way, making sure that all Halifax residents are benefit from and contribute to our growing prosperity here in our city. So my organization works in lockstep with Halifax Regional Municipality. The mayor and the CAO of the city are both on my board and we are their economic development arm. So our functional business units involve, we have a significant labor team that helps uh, attract and retain talent to our city, connect them to employers. We have uh, an investment attraction team that promotes Halifax, sells Halifax to the world and really helps businesses around the world hear about the advantages of locating here in our city. We have the project to stand up Halifax's innovation district, which is now uh, stood up. We have an innovation district and that's really about celebrating our high concentration of startups and scale-ups in our community and our research and development capabilities. 
Um, and we also have the team of economists and researchers that track Halifax's economic progress. And then, of course, a marketing team and all the other functions that you would have within any organization. So we are a not-for-profit. Our purpose, sole purpose is, is growing the prosperity of our city. Wonderful. And, and when you think about growing that prosperity, uh, what do you what what would you describe as a good city as being? So you're trying to make Halifax more prosperous, presumably within the context of making Halifax a great place to live, uh, which it already is making it a better place to live. Of course, um, what do you see as the important elements of a good city to live in? So. Some of the building blocks for sure is making sure that it is an inclusive city. And so a big part of our work uh, is also working with the African Nova Scotia community and standing up the African Nova Scotia Road to Economic Prosperity. So our African Nova Scotia community has been here for over 400 years, many of the families, but just for a variety of reasons have not had access to the same economic opportunities. So we're working now and have an a incredible leader in the ANS community, Carol Ann Wright, who's our director in this area, uh, standing up this work. So what makes a great city? Making sure that we're not leaving citizens behind. And then when we're not, <laughs> to quote our mayor, Mayor Savage, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have an excellent quality of life, but it's hard to have a great quality of life when you're unemployed and poor. So first and foremost, how do we make sure that more of our citizens are attached to labor force? Uh, and then we can build for there. So what makes our city great and where we can double down on our unique culture and connection to community. So we're still a relatively small, well, we're a mid-sized city at 450,000 and we have aspirations to grow to 550,000 because what we can do as a city uh, when we reach a population of that size. So connection to community, connection to nature, of course, access to meaningful employment. And for us, um, double down uh, on our green economy. Um, earlier through COVID, we stood up Halifax, which is our city's ambitious climate action plan, um, first of its kind in Canada. Uh, so clean, green, active, healthy, and a uh, connection to employment and, um, and connection to culture and the arts. So we have all those building blocks in place. Um, we're now looking to really accentuate those and making sure that more people have access. Uh, and, and it is a great place uh, to live now. I've visited frequently and, uh, and I can attest to that. Uh, so, I'm keen to understand how the Halifax community had been changing or had changed prior to COVID-19. What were the trends that you saw uh, before the pandemic struck? So, 2019 was a record year for Halifax on a number of fronts. So, to back up a few years, Halifax and all of Nova Scotia had been uh, experiencing demographic decline, aging population, many of our young people leaving for work elsewhere, uh, you know, coming to university, coming to post-secondary, and then leaving to find employment elsewhere. And we really turned the tide on that around 2015 for a number of reasons, including some very proactive immigration policy and, and including just a changing mindset and, you know, success attracts success. So attracting some anchor companies here that continue to grow and attract others. So in 2019, we had our uh, banner year for population growth, almost 10,000 new residents to Halifax, over two thirds coming from outside of Canada. We were seeing uh, record uh, employment numbers, record labor force attachment, um, all, all firing on all cylinders, firing on all cylinders. Um, 2020, so then COVID, 
so we were just, you know, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves, still are, still are, but uh, then COVID hit and a big part of our uh, attraction, uh, population attraction is related to students and international students. And of course, they're all students and working in a, a learning in a virtual environment right now. So that was a big impact coming into 2020. Um, the good news is uh, our population, as we receive population stats from July to July. So population for Halifax from July 2019 to July 2020, so only three months in COVID time, uh, was our second highest record number at 9,015 new residents. Again, um, over two thirds coming from outside of Canada. And for us, immigration is a huge focus of our growth. As I mentioned, some of our history of stagnant or declining growth, turning the tide through immigration is incredibly important to us. And also the makeup of our population. So um, we had an aging demographic, which of course, for maybe younger demographic, taking your class, Peter, uh, it's hard to envision, but as a, as a community and as a society, if you get more of your population moving into retirement age, if you when you plot that out, everybody gets exactly a year older every year, very predictably, if you do not have new people coming into your community, then that, you know, we were, we were facing a bit of a demographic cliff in terms of our ability to fund healthcare in the province, our schools, uh, retain young people, keep, keep that dynamism. And we totally turned the tide on that now. Uh, our latest stats show that our, our population makeup, even coming through COVID, Number one population makeup is uh, 25 to 29 year olds in Halifax. Number two largest band of age, 30 to 34. Uh, and followed by number three, no offense to anybody in this demographic, 55 to 59. So we would have been squarely owning that 55 to 59 demographic. So to see these young people who are now probably graduated from post-secondary making their homes here is widely important to us. So through COVID, population slowing, growth slowing. However, obviously our borders, our international borders are shut. What your students may not know is our provincial borders have been largely shut for over a year since March, end of March, 2020, which is not the reality when you're living in Ontario or most, uh, of the rest of Canada. So Nova Scotia borders shut end of March, April, May, June, July, they opened to the rest of Canada, uh, in Atlantic Canada in the Atlantic bubble um, for July, August, September, October, into November, shut again, and have just opened up in the last week to people from outside of um, Nova Scotia, just Atlantic Canada. Then just now, have we opened up to the rest of Canada uh, without quarantine? So you could have, you could come here before for most of it. There was a couple months where you could not, but you could come here before, but you had to quarantine for 14 days, um, self-isolate for 14 days. So that decimated our tourism industry. Our airport, our airport, our airport was down to about 10% or less of load following um, absolutely record years previous. We were, we had knocked it out of the park on hotel night stays right before the year before COVID 2019, um, better than our 10 year average, gone to vacancy rates never seen before. So appreciating that the rest of Canada's tourism and hospitality have been hit hard, ours in certain sectors were hit even harder just because we did not have the ability to welcome people from anywhere else than Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. So how that's shaken out through COVID is um, we had continued strong growth in certain sectors, um, professional services, R&D uh, services, education services, um, doing very well in construction and doing incredibly poorly in tourism, hospitality and retail trade. And how that all shook out was in the early months of 2021, we were leading the country in job growth, both by percentage and actual numbers. 
leading by actual numbers is huge for us because we're a population of 450,000. So to be leading Toronto or leading Vancouver in actual numbers is that mind blowing for us. Then we hit our third wave later than the rest of Canada it hit us around April and we lost our pole position in that spot. But what we, you know, what I tell our sectors, our, our CEOs in, in hospitality, our restaurateurs, is that you know, we acknowledge that they have just been smacked down so hard like no one could ever imagine. But the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is our fundamentals are there. So we've had job growth in many sectors, in high paying job sectors, and our population continues to grow. And I think largely how with all those those borders being shut down and our government, our provincial government pulling the trigger probably quicker than anywhere else in Canada, you know, at, at first at sparks of COVID um, meant that we could live quite normally for most of the last 16 months. And so because of that, we've seen record intra-provincial migration. So in the last quarter, uh, we welcomed 1,800, over 1,800 new residents from other provinces uh, outside, of, outside of Nova Scotia. That's a provincial stat, but the majority of those would, would be landing in HRM. So we're, we're very optimistic that when our borders start to open, they have now to um, Canadians who have received two doses of vaccine. Um, and have waited those 14 days for efficacy that um, we the vibrancy will come back even for those hardest hit sectors and like I'm sure that much of the rest of Canada the impacts have been largely felt by uh, women um, and by uh, and by youth and of course um, you know for your class largely perhaps STEM students and engineers you know, what does this mean around public policy? How are the um, infrastructure spending and the other type of economic stimulus that governments would normally put in place in a recession, um, if these are women that are being largely impacted because the sectors that they work in or their inability to take work because of lack of childcare because the schools are closed, what does that mean about our best defense and our best response as we come out of here, and what does that mean? How do we how do we really buffer ourselves against in future impacts of you know unforeseen similar events into the future? So those are some of the things that we're thinking deeply about now, um, and how can we as a community support those people that have not been able to work during uh, during COVID? So after COVID, um, you're booming. Uh, for want of a better word, before COVID, uh, the impact of COVID economically was variable. There were some areas that did well. There were other areas that were hit very hard. What will after COVID look like? Will it go back to the way it was before COVID? Or do you think there are uh, fundamental things that have happened during COVID that will mean that things are different afterwards. You were referring to uh, the impact on women and other sections of the population um, uh, uh, being disproportionately hit. Uh, will they come back quickly or do you think you know that there is going to be a need as you seem to be leading towards uh, for a specific action to address the, the, uh, the disparities there? So we have some early indicators around how people who have been disproportionately affected during COVID will do coming out of COVID from our shut down, open, shut open kind of scenario within our province um, and within our city during this time. And uh, women and youth rebounded quite well in the workforce once our bars and restaurants opened up through the summer and then again got hit hard once we uh, experienced shutdown. So um, we are feeling optimistic around when we are in a more open scenario that these individuals will find work. 
I'm sure like you're hearing in other parts of the country that now our tourism sector is having a harder time meeting their labor needs as um, individuals have found employment elsewhere. And, you know, it, it's brought to light some gaps in our collective knowledge around who are working in these industries. So tourism, for instance, you know, early days, our chief economist was asking, okay, who are we really talking about here? Are we talking about um, who has lost their jobs? Is it a university student that is studying biomedical engineering, but working at a hotel front desk through the summers as they complete their studies? Or is it a mid-career person who's worked in a hotel all their lives and this is what they're trained to do and all they know? And so it did uncover that we know very little about that, but the labor shortages that were are kind of coming to the fore now within the tourism sector um, are suggesting at least in, in part, it's the former. You know, it's, it's students and young people that are choosing to work in hospitality um, for, for the period of time that they're at in their lives. But if COVID has made them rethink that, they're finding other ways to spend their time and find livelihoods, and including um, you know, startups working for or creating entrepreneurial ventures. We've seen very strong uh, creation of business during this time. Um, so those are some of the trends that we're watching going forward. We've also been very successful at attracting companies to Halifax right through the COVID, like bulk of the COVID period. So over the last fiscal year, uh, we 17 companies that we've worked with along with our provincial partners have made the decision to move to Halifax, um, to either to expand here or locate here. Together, the, this group, together they'll be hiring over a thousand uh, new employees. So we're working on a scenario that coming out of COVID, Halifax could be the most desirable location on the Eastern Seaboard uh, because of choice. You know, Peter, you asked me early on what makes a great community and, and I mentioned many factors, but I maybe didn't mention choice. And here in Halifax, uh, we have this very interesting um, urban rural mix. Because our geography is so big, um, Nova Scotia is, is if for those of you who have visited, you know, it's, we certainly have major municipalities, but then there's lots of green space in between. And now through technology, individuals can choose to live in very rural settings, on the beach, live in Lawrencetown, wake up and go surfing every morning, out your doorstep and then log on to wherever, you, whoever you're working on, in, um, whoever you're working with in the world. And so we've seen that shift. We've seen that reflected in our interprovincial migration numbers. But in talking to some of these employers, uh, one of the companies who work with Access Capital, they hired 187 people through the height of COVID, um, from mainly from other parts of Canada. Um, they're now very focused on, on getting the majority of that workforce here. And we're hearing that um, time and time again. And, and you know, for your students to think about, and something we're really grappling around, you know, as an organization who has employees and as we work with many companies, is what does this digital, um, the ability to work digitally, what does that mean for the culture of our organizations? And when you were asking, you know, what does Halifax look like coming out of here? Um, right now, you know, vibrancy of our downtown is top of mind for my organization, many that we work with, uh, because a big part of our ability to attract you, <laughs> young people, talent and business to our city is the vibrancy of, the, of our downtowns, our music scene, the bars and restaurants, our vibrant waterfront, and if everybody is just working from home all of the time in our own space, that vibrancy is diminished. So time will tell how we as, as employers, as works, you know, as workspaces show up, how does that affect our transit needs? How does that affect our infrastructure that we need in our downtown? How does that affect our um, office space? space needs, which right now our vacancy is uh, is quite high, hovering around 20%, where our industrial space is very low. 
because of course if you're if you're working in light manufacturing you can't do that from the comfort of your bedroom you've got to show up so um all of these infrastructure needs for our city are in flux um but we do feel that because of the the lifestyle the choice that you have here within Halifax Regional Municipality that we will continue to attract people at record numbers and in our early conversations with our friends at the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration even last June 2020 they were processing a record number of immigration applications those people just physically couldn't get here so we are preparing for um, even a greater pace of growth. And in the last 12 month period, July 2019 to July 2020, we were second in Canada, um, just in terms of population growth, just behind Oshawa. And we're even bracing ourselves, happily bracing ourselves for, for an uptick and we're about 2.1%. Now, where this has, uh, we're experiencing some growing pains is around housing and housing prices and availability. So when we're looking to attract people and businesses to Halifax, our value prop proposition is talent, location, cost, and innovation. And that cost piece is somewhat being eroded. And when you think around the uh, economics of people moving from Toronto or Vancouver and coming to Halifax, which has traditionally been a, a lower cost jurisdiction, lower cost housing market, um, if you sell your house in Toronto and you come here with a bag of money to Halifax, as that is as a Halifax resident, that is very difficult to compete against in our market. So we have seen over the last COVID time uh, record record increases in housing costs up across the board by about 15%. Interestingly, 20% in rural. So again, you know, who is choosing to show up and live here? What kind of means they're bringing with us? Interest rates are at record lows. That is impacting our, uh, our residents who are already here and what they can afford. And from an economic development lens, um, it's impacting, you know, for how long are we gonna be able to use cost as a value proposition? And when we're talking to companies and they're making a decision where they're going to move, well, we're now as a city, we're, we're nowhere close in terms of cost. I'm a Vancouverite by birth, so I know Vancouver well, but we're nowhere close to Vancouver and Toronto price, but we're, our former peers of cities, mid-sized cities in, in Canada, we're kind of leaving them behind. And as we grow and as we become more well known across Canada and around the world, we were uh, number one, well then tied with Charlottetown, number, <laughs> number of one tied uh, for Blake Best, McLean's Best Places to Live in 2021. So as we gain better recognition, we attract more and more people, we attract more and more business, it makes it, um, we start moving out of our comparator cities. And how will that affect affect the flows of people in business and their ability to afford to live here and their ability uh, to find viable accommodations here. It almost sounds like Halifax is growing and moving forward into new areas and a new uh, way of uh, living, new governance that might be required in order to deal with the new uh, with the new city that will emerge from the changes that we're seeing. I thought what you said uh, about the impact technology was having in a range of areas was very interesting uh, because you then went on to consider the impact of these things on each other. You're saying new people are coming, that's good because technology is enabling them to come and to work there. But at the same time, you were talking about the welcome pressures uh, that this was placing on the community. Uh, but also you were talking about the uh, factors which are drawing them there, the wonderful place that Halifax is to live, but the impact technology was having uh, on the retail and uh, you know entertainment 
bars, restaurants, that type of thing, sector do. Uh, so it's about how all of these things come together uh, that will, you know, determine what will come out of this. But I think what I'm hearing is that you're saying uh, we have all these things happening at the same time, but Halifax is going to be even greater. Yes. <laughs> that is what I'm saying. Um, and it's it's the intersectionality as as you've shared with all of these um, with all of these elements and nobody knows. like no one in the world knows how this is going to shake out. It's we've never been in this place before. And I early on in the pandemic, I texted uh, the president of one of our post-secondary institutions, um, that, uh, that is just one of my favorite people. And I, I said, you know, how, how are you doing? And he said, geez, you know, he goes, I'm okay, but I, I must've been sick the day that we studied pandemics in leadership school. Like, it doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter the experience you've had. If you're leading through this time or just living through this time, nobody's been here before. So all bets are off. We can only, Things really set our sights on where we want to go and, and do our best to buffer that. And, you know, when when you share that, you know, yeah, we're in, we're in this bit of this transition period between, you know, medium cities, big cities, you know, how we're kind of ascending. Our mayor, Mayor Mike Savage, is, is the head of the, the big city mayor's conference. So he he's now, he chairs that group of, of all the biggest cities. Uh, the mayors of all the biggest cities in Canada. And uh, um, and for us, it's pieces like that. It's, it's like, okay, this is a new era for our city. Um, but some of the other, some of the other things for your, your students to think about, um, when we're talking to our large tech employers, and we have many here, you know, IBM is north of 700 people now, and has consistently over the last several quarters been um, the leading client innovation center for IBM in the world. We have uh, RBC uh, continuing to grow their operations here in all variety of their uh, areas, including, of course, you know, banking the front facing, but in terms of their the innovation and IT work. Um, and we're hearing more and more from our tech sector of all sides that they've never They've never seen the rate of turnover before in their staff because with remote work, a employer in Kitchener and Waterloo or an employer in New York or an employer in Buenos Aires can hire um, talent here in Halifax. And pre-COVID, that would have meant, you know, do I move my family to Toronto or New York or Buenos Aires? That's a big move. What's that going to mean for lifestyle? It would have been a difficult decision. But many of our IT companies, well, the majority of the staff is still working from home. So in a lot of cases, um, their, their staff teams, if they were to take other employment, they don't even need to stand up. They would just log into a different system. And... Um, and if these uh, employers are based in larger cities where there's much higher wage pressures, they're being lured away with higher salaries. So that is causing our employers to think more about, A, you know, what type of salaries are we, are we offering here? Is it, is it world competitive now, not just Halifax or Nova Scotia or Atlantic Canadian competitive? Um, and what are we doing to create a really strong culture within our organization? And how does this perhaps um, hybrid model of work play versus having, you know, it's more difficult to create a strong culture and connection to place if all your employees are working from home. So what is the right mix in terms of getting people to the office? But the flip side of that is our employers here now are realizing that they too can hire top talent located at all around the world, people who maybe otherwise, uh, because of their nationality or where they where they were located, uh, would not have considered a move to Halifax. But now, if they can just log on to a system, so it goes both ways. It's a it's a multifaceted effects of of this remote work, and it's going to impact everything from what infrastructure I've already mentioned, what infrastructure we need, both in terms of office space, but community infrastructure, roads, parking how people are moving around our city. Um, 
our our head of uh, kind of planning roads for the city um, shared the other day that our travel, um, the number of cars on the roads has largely not diminished during COVID. Just the travel patterns have totally changed. Now, I, I've joked, I'm not sure if that means everybody's at I, in the Ikea parking lot when they otherwise would be in their office, um, but it, it also means, of course, during COVID, um, people were not using our transit system as they had before. We were down in around the 40% range usage at one point, but you know, people have not been at a standstill. They just are moving at different times in different ways for different reasons, and how much of that is gonna continue? We don't know. No, what you referred there to the skills challenges, I guess, that companies might face, uh, also the skills opportunities in uh, accessing skills from outside the region too. But does that impact what might be done in Halifax region um, as far as skills are concerned too? You know, do colleges and universities and other organizations uh, need to do more there? Uh, how, how, does, how is that being looked at from an economic development point of view? Yeah, so um, like I'm, I would imagine in Ontario as well, much more of a focus on micro-credentialing, much more of a focus, especially for, well, yeah, I would say even medium to larger employers taking on their own professional development because especially in certain in tech fields, um, the pace of change is so, so rapid. Uh, also, a, a lot of, um, you know, continuing to stress the importance of uh, a wide variety of skills. I've heard it described from some CEOs in the tech industry as the adult in the room. How you train the adult in the room or even put that on the business card, I'm not sure, but just like your students taking this course that is giving them, giving you a wider different perspectives, you know, how are we training more uh, holistically uh, of students? Um, and really encouraged by programs, you may be familiar in Ontario, palletskills.org that we're getting involved with here in the Atlantic around upskilling, um, taking individuals that have a certain skill set such as sales and training them up to be professionals in IT sales to fill specific gaps. Um, and also doubling down on really the amount of available seats. Our provincial government has partnered with Dal and some of our other post-secondaries to materially increase their computer science seats, um, both in terms of uh, students and faculty. And then using that, we will use that as a lever to attract companies here and to help encourage companies to grow. So, um, I would say that, you know, for us, such a blessing to have the depth and breadth of post-secondary that we have and a very strong community college system throughout the province. We have one community college with 13 campuses because they really do work in lockstep with industry. And again, it's like predicting the future. You know, we don't know what the, uh, the skills of the future are going to be, um, but I, I do know that the line of communication between industry and our post-secondary are very, very good. And it's, uh, it's in fact shaping curriculum as well as shaping where the resources are going. So um, future looks bright. The most parts of Canada, most parts of the world are going through change at the moment. I'm interested too in how governments respond to that change. So uh, as far as Halifax goes, uh, could you describe how the various levels of government, perhaps municipal, uh, provincial, federal, uh, are, uh, uh, are contributing to supporting the change uh, that is now taking place and will take place in the future? I, you know, a bit, I would say big kudos to my colleagues at Halifax Regional Municipality and led by mayor and council and CEO and his team for, for thinking deeply about best practice around the world and bringing that back here. I was very uh, honored to participate with the mayor on 
uh, monthly calls with Michael Bloomberg at Harvard um, that they put on for uh, for mayors, uh, mainly U.S. based, but around the world, and just sharing best practices. Um, so, you know, they put a lot of effort into um, into staying connected of what what's going on globally and how we could bring that back here, and that that permeates all of our being. So that's everything from the electric ferries that we're looking to stand up in Halifax Harbor between Bedford, which is a adjacent community in Halifax, um, to placemaking initiatives and ideas that we're taking from Europe and elsewhere, um, to uh, even more interesting for your students looking into taxation schemes, to looking into um, downtown and Main Street revitalization. So I would say that our, our municipal leaders um, have really invested in their own knowledge. And so I think there's been such an interesting cultural shift right now in general around people have been have never been more, and organizations and institutions have never been more open-minded to new ways of doing things. So if you're gonna get something done that has never been done before, now's the time. I don't know how long this window will be open, but you know, people, I think, sweeping generalization, but they, it is my observation that leaders anytime, and especially now, want to be seen like they're doing something useful. <laughs> and so since nobody's done this before, a lot of times people don't know what useful is. So really being open-minded to new ideas. We're seeing that at the provincial government and wanting to be really responsive. So as an example, there was a, there's a group that's been st stood up uh, NS Black is an acronym, but it's a Nova Scotia wide business and labor coalition um, that brings together on a weekly or more call with all three orders of government and about a hundred others, mainly organizational folks like myself who are running organizations to say, okay, this is what's happening now. This is this government program. How is it affecting business? How do we solve that? And it's really solving challenges in real time. So way more collaboration than before. And the feds, um, you know, through Innovation Solutions Canada, they're they're spending a lot of money on supporting our startups and scale-ups, uh, which is very, very welcome. And I would say being very nimble in terms of, of this constant improvement and feedback loop from, okay, here's a program. How'd that work? Nope. Okay. <laughs> you know, back week. And again, that's this kind of, you know, 360 type of feedback that certainly it never has never happened at that at this type of pace before you started your answer there with talking about how uh the, this program at harvard with bloomberg was was an example of how the community and local government was looking outside for ideas making sure they were aware of what was going on in the world and uh you know usually we think that is really important uh, in ensuring that the community becomes more innovative uh, and is, you know, responding uh, and ready for the future. Um, innovation itself is often thought to be very, is, is, is part of what that would be, but it's thought to be uh, even more important today in economic development. So I thought as my second last question, I would just ask you, to comment on uh, the uh, innovation environment generally in Halifax, uh, the way that the local economic development is trying to encourage that and, and what's going on there. So I, I mentioned at the uh, outset, the um, in Halifax is innovation district, and we also have a uh, Halifax's Innovation Outpost at Volta, which is our incubator, similar to Communitat uh, in Kitchener, Waterloo. Um, but these are these are really just supporting agents of this incredibly vibrant innovation ecosystem that is created not just in Halifax, but I would say throughout Nova Scotia. Um, it has it's never been a better time to to start a company here, there's a uh, there's a lot of support, especially for um, at within our post secondaries, and then individuals who are coming out of post secondaries and starting 
uh, starting business. Um, where where we uh, look to add value is connecting these nascent businesses um, to corporates. So as you mentioned, you know it's never been a more important time to innovate, and we think innovation. We're thinking about creating something new or creating new value. Um, in order for our existing businesses to survive and thrive, especially during this time, they need to do that just as much as 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 an as a brand new startup would. And so, where we're where we play a role is in piloting um, startups, products, and services, either you know within our own organization, working with the municipality. And working, I mentioned at the outset that we're public-private, so we're owned by government, primarily municipal government, as our larger funder, and then about 100 private sector businesses, really our largest employers in Halifax. And so we're working with them to prototype, to test, and pilot um, the products and services coming out of our startups and scale-ups, uh, which ideally, A, it gives startups and scale-ups early customer and which is important anytime especially earlier days of COVID when no one was quite sure what fundraising money would look like during this time so you need customers regardless so a finding some early customers for these companies also often you know we're looking to to grow global companies here and when our companies are looking to export they're being asked well Who's using your product or service in Halifax? Is your own government using your product or service? So we're looking to create that opportunity for them, but also from the established corporate, not only do they, it's important for them to stumble across or invest in or grow new innovations that will be helpful for their business, it also pushes them to be more nimble and fast moving themselves. So we've encountered that where it's difficult for a corporate to do business with a, a startup or scale up because, you know, the legal documentation or the HR documentation or the contracting is just not right sized for the company that they're working with now. And so that's some of the areas that we're focused on now to help both build our, in it, our startup ecosystem as well as innovation writ large in our city. Very important. My last question. Uh, is uh, the people who are watching this are going to be completing their studies soon. They'll be moving into employment. Uh, based on your experience, uh, what advice would you like to leave them with? And this can be anything you want. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Well, first, come and visit Halifax. You can contemplate your future while you're having a great time here on the waterfront or hiking in nature, visiting the beach. Um, but also one thing that I wished, you know, as somebody who's probably 20 years ahead, Peter, of where your students are now, I just wish I'd taken more risks. I wish that I had taken more time to start a business or work for a startup or be a bit more creative about my employment because it, it certainly doesn't get easier as you take on more responsibility through your life and you have homes and kids and boats and cars and other trappings. So just if you have a crazy idea, follow that. If you see a company that is uh, starting out and you don't think it's going to be secure, well, you know, everybody has their own situation. You have to eat and pay rent. But now is the time to do that thing because you will have many, many job opportunities and career opportunities between now in 20 years from now, and I still have about 20 years left, so uh, not on this planet, I hope, working. <laughs> um, but now is the time to take those risks and just be really creative with what you choose. Um, because the, the time for safe and secure, you know, that will come. And who knows how, you know, the people who are our inspiration, who are my inspiration uh, here in Halifax really are the entrepreneurs. And they're, they're the you know, we say hella famous. They're the hella famous ones, the ones who have really created something from nothing. They took a lot of risk to do it. Might as well take that risk as early as you can 
and just keep you know nimble and loose and fluid and and it, it will uh, eventually there's time time for security later down the road great advice and uh thank you for taking the time to talk to me today wendy uh, i've really enjoyed our discussion and uh, i know it will be valuable for the students <laughs>